Good afternoon and welcome to our informatics seminar. So I'm really pleased to present Sean Young today uh, as our speaker. And Sean is the executive director of the University of California Institute for Prediction Technology. He's also an assistant professor of family medicine and his work focuses on studying how social media and mobile technologies can be used to predict and change community and global health behaviors among at-risk populations. So he's the uh, principal investigator of the Harnessing Online Peer Education Social Media Studies, also known as HOPE. And this showed how social media can be used to increase HIV prevention and testing among at-risk uh, populations in LA, but also in Peru. So, uh, Sean has a bachelor's degree in ethnomusicology from UCLA. And uh, during these studies, I presume during these studies, he uh, was very interested in the music in Brazil and in India, and he just told me that he had traveled uh, throughout Brazil to um, try to understand music better. Uh, he received a master's degree in, uh, at Stanford, PhD at Stanford, both in psychology, and he also received a master's degree in health services research at Stanford University School of Medicine. And an interesting factoid about <laughs> Sean that coincides with his interest in ethnomusicology, he was a, in a punk band in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Like down here, going to share the punk band story. I would have showed up with a mohawk. Or a <laughs> well, thanks, so much, Gloria. Uh, thanks, everyone, for for coming today. Uh, it's been such a great experience so far. Spending time with Gloria, um, with Matt, with Jillian, getting to to talk with you guys, and look forward to presenting. Um, and it's just nice being. I, I'm. Uh, from nearby originally, so it's always nice coming back home. So I am, as Gloria mentioned, uh, an assistant professor. I'm in family medicine at UCLA, and uh, here to talk to you today about mining digital behavior. So using this is using social media data for monitoring real world outcomes. Um, is also calling this reading between the tweets because what what we like to do is can we interpret uh, my backgrounds in behavioral and social psychology so can we interpret how people are using technologies can we interpret their whether it's text that they're talking that they're using on social media um, or can we understand the behaviors of the way they're interacting with technologies and use that to predict events um, and along with that, we have, this is a new University of California Institute for Prediction Technology where we're bringing <coughs> together researchers across UC campuses to study how can we use this data to predict events in health and medicine, in security and crime, in politics, um, in all different fields. And Fortunate to have, for example, um, Michael Carey, who's here from computer science. He's he's uh, not only the site director from UCI, but we've been fortunate to work with him. He's created an asterisk platform, which is just amazing in providing the ability for big data to analyze all this. Uh, okay, so let's get started here. Does anyone? Does anyone know what this is a picture of? Is it? What's that? Star bets. Stock bets. Did I hear something else? It's a gambling thing. Something. Gambling thing. Yeah. So, so I was in. Uh, this was the end of March. I was in Las Vegas, and <laughs> this is March Madness. So, this is March Madness basketball. There, I had never been there before. My cousins, uh, my cousins who are doctors, they and their doctor friends go every year to this for 15 years to go bet on the March Madness teams. And this was crazy to me. The, 
So you just see there's this desk here where you come up and you place your bets on the teams, and you can bet on anything. You can bet on um, who's the number of points at the end of the game, number of points at halftime. The, you can, they'll take your bets on literally anything. And so this line, this guy in the white shirt's at the front of the line, but it goes back and it's an hour long line to get up to the front and place your bets. And so while people are waiting, they're really excited to bet. And they are just betting with each other while they're in line. You know, everyone is wanting to make predictions. And so what, this, what we're gonna talk about today is making predictions. Um, if we could be able to better predict things in the future, we could be able to uh, reduce outbreaks of disease or address outbreaks of disease. We could reduce crime. Um, we could improve political decision making. If we could improve predictions, there's a lot that we could do to affect and improve real world outcomes. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that people make predictions. So here, for example, um, I don't know if, if you guys were following, but UCI had, you guys went to, uh, you were in, in March Madness. Uh, I, I bet on UCI and lost, lost against Louisville. But, uh, but so people would, my reasoning for betting on UCI was, well, I grew up around here. It's a UC team. Um, other people would bet on teams because of the colors. Other people would bet on teams because they did research and thought the team would win. Um, but we're scientists, and so we, when we make predictions about things, we do it based on data. So here's another, who knows what this is? Moneyball. Moneyball. Right. So what was Moneyball about? Analytics, right. So the story of Moneyball is the story of the coach, Billy Bean, who is Brad Pitt. And, and Brad Pitt recruits Jonah Hill, who's playing a statistician, so that they could put together a winning baseball team. They, had, they didn't have a great record. Um, he was coaching the Oakland A's. And he recruits a statistician who could look at statistics of baseball players and ultimately, they put together a winning team based on recording the data of the different baseball players. So that, was, that took place in 2001. And a lot's changed since then. So about 15 years later, with all kinds of technological devices and improvements, we now have a lot more data that we can look at. So for example, if we look to social media every day, there's about 500 million tweets that are sent every day. There's about 55 million status updates on Facebook every day. Uh, and these are, these are the big social networks. These are the big social media sites. If we look to the ones that are, that are smaller, we have on Instagram about 70 million photos perfectly filtered photos that are shared each day. We have 700 million on Snapchat. Snapchat's a small startup. 700 million snaps sent every day. It's a lot of information that, that we can use. Um, so, so back in, in 2004 or so, when Facebook came out, there was the, the question of, will people, will people share information? Uh, we talked about this a little bit this morning with Matt. Uh, so will people share information? That was a question. Would people use social media sites like Facebook? <laughs> we now know that people are very comfortable sharing information. And not only will they share information, they'll share really personal information. They'll talk about whether they were driving drunk. They'll talk about sexually transmitted diseases, drugs that they're using. They'll talk about sexual risk behaviors, things that they're going to do. We call this, we're calling this social data. These are data which provides information about people's behaviors. And examples are tweets or 
snaps from Snapchat, wearables device data, search data, and, and mobile app data. And so it was with this in mind that we developed the Institute for Prediction Technology where, uh, where I'd like to tell you a little bit more about this and, and see if I can get you guys involved. So this was, was a call from the office of the president, from President Napolitano to study social data and see how can we predict events. <coughs> and we bring together a team from broad areas, different areas of expertise. And we have people working in big data, in psychology, in technology, in public health, across different disciplines, across different schools in the University of California. And we're doing this ultimately with the, with the goal of using, you know, whether it's social media data, whether it's online search data, whether it's image data, all to predict events. So let me give a, a case study of, of one of these examples within the area of health and medicine. And I'll tell you how we ultimately got here um, by talking about some research that we've done on digital behavior within the area of HIV. So around 2008, we noticed something interesting. We had been studying social media for a few years and how people use social media. Um, but we noticed that popular press was, this was the first time I noticed the popular press was picking up that people were using technologies to find new <coughs> sex partners. This was a, an article um, about Craigslist where they found people were posting headless pictures of themselves to search for sexual partners on Craigslist. Kind of a precursor to, to what happens on Grindr and Jacked, if you guys have heard of those um, sex seeking apps. And this was important because if people are using technologies to find sex partners, researchers need to be aware of these technologies so they can use the same technologies to prevent HIV transmission, that we need to keep up to date with technologies that are being used to, to possibly transmit HIV so that we can prevent it. And there was, there was a lot of questions though about if we started using social media, if we started using technologies for HIV prevention, would the people who are at the greatest risk use it? So people at high risk for HIV in the United States are African American and Latino populations and men who have sex with men are some of the highest risk groups. And so there were questions about these groups don't have access to technologies um, and weren't using technologies. And so we began looking uh, we began looking at the data and Pew had done a lot of research showing that actually African Americans and Latinos were the fastest growing social media users. And then they continued growing in use for using social networking sites, online video, Twitter, and, and location services. And it wasn't just people of color who are frequently using social media, but we also found, so gay populations who are at high risk for HIV were also frequent users of, of social media sites. And so we put this together and decided to build, uh, to build an online community which integrates psychology of changing behavior into online communities. And we called this the HOPE Social Media Intervention, standing for Harnessing Online Peer Education. And what we did was, with these interventions, we would train peer leaders, so we would recruit uh, peer leaders from a certain population <coughs> within HIV. These were African American and Latino men who have sex with men. We'd recruit peer leaders to an online community. Initially we did this on Facebook. And then the peer leaders, we would train them 
and they would begin passing on information to other participants in these closed Facebook groups with the goal of seeing could we increase HIV testing over time. Uh, and this, the intervention was successful. So people who were in our HOPE groups were about three times as likely to get an HIV test as those who were in a control group. So it was successful intervention. Um, and ultimately ended up being scaled. So we started in Los Angeles and then it went to Peru and Brazil and outside of HIV to mental health and to drug use. And with the data, we realized there were some interesting things happening. We could look at the data. Well, for one thing, since we were doing this on social media, we could look at their social network ties, look at relationships between how their social network ties changed over time. And for example, we found that people who, within these groups, those who made more friends with other people in the groups were more likely to go get an HIV test. They're more likely to change their sexual risk behaviors from baseline to follow-up. We also had a lot of data on what was their actual conversations that they were having. So we, this was a, it was a 12-week intervention each time we do a HOPE study, and we collect 12 weeks of transcripts of how participants are talking to each other and talking to peer leaders. And then we actually keep it, uh, some of these communities, which were started four years ago, continue, people continue talking on them. They're actively, uh, people are actively engaged in the communities. But over a 12-week period, we'll collect these conversations and, and we found, for example, there's a lot of talking going on People are, are sharing all kinds of information. These are some examples of, uh, of the content that people are talking about. So they would talk about HIV prevention and testing, showing the, the intervention was working the way it was supposed to. Um, they would talk about HIV and stigma. They would talk about personal, personal topics. And that was a really interesting finding that we didn't anticipate. So we would, we were bringing together strangers really. They didn't know each other. We were bringing strangers who are at risk for HIV into an online community. And what we found is each one of these columns is a four week period of the 12 week intervention. And so if you look, look down at friendly conversation for example. So friendly conversation in the first four weeks there was a lot of friendly conversation. <coughs> People saying, hey, what's going on? Um, or why am I here? <laughs> um, and then, but that over the four week period, the friendly conversation would decrease and the conversation related to HIV topics would increase. So we are, trust was growing within the communities. But something that was really interesting is within that first four weeks, strangers were sharing all kinds of personal information with each other. So they were talking, immediately they started talking about um, who they were having sex with, drugs that they were using. The, so these were men who have sex with men who were talking about the stigma of what it was like coming out, or maybe they hadn't disclosed that they were having sex with other men. That became a really interesting topic that we didn't anticipate. And at the same time, uh, at the same time something was going on where, where you could look to Twitter for being able to identify influenza outbreaks. And so we thought people are having, people who join our online communities who are strangers are sharing this personal information so quickly, it's on a closed community. What if we look to something that's public? What if we look to Twitter and see, will people search for, will people talk about personal information on Twitter also? You know, so the real question was, is Twitter something that people just have meaningless conversations about? Do they just make jokes on Twitter? Or can we use real-time social media like Twitter for ways to better understand, monitor, and ultimately predict important real-world outcomes like outbreaks of disease? So we, looked, we wanted to look to Twitter as a tool for secondary data analysis. Uh, in the area of 
of HIV, for example, you have to wait not only months, sometimes years, in order to get data on HIV cases. And, and this is, there are so many fields like this where you have to wait for whether it's a public health department or the government to release access to data for people to analyze the data. So if there was a way to be able to, to uh, anticipate and to predict before waiting for those data sets, that would be really valuable. So we wanted to see, could we look at people's tweets and could we extract psychological or behavioral information about what people are talking about and use that information, in this case it was to convey whether people were about to engage in sex or drug risk behaviors, so HIV related risk behaviors. We then wanted to see could we map those behaviors on a US map and could we use that uh, as a method for monitoring, remote monitoring of HIV transmission. HIV cases. So we connected to, to Twitter. Twitter is open. It allows, it allows people to get 1% of all tweets. So for free, you can write a, write a script and be able to have access to 1% of all tweets um, through their API. And so we collected over about a six month period, we collected over 550 million tweets. These were 1%, the 1% of tweets. We then wanted uh, just geolocated tweets just for the United States. Uh, and, and we created some keywords and phrases that were related to HIV risk behaviors. So either they were either drug related because drug uh, HIV transmission is related to drug use, or they were sex related, so HIV is sexually transmitted. <clears throat> and so this, these keywords and phrases narrowed it down from the 2.1 million geolocated tweets, we had now a group of about 10,000 tweets. So here are some examples of, of the tweets. Down at the bottom, those are just general tweets that people would send. Um, I'm watching the Celtics game right now. I'm heading to take my exam. Wish me luck. And then there are the sex-related <coughs> and substance use-related tweets where people would say, I need sex right now. Um, or anybody want to get high with a substance use-related tweet, for example. So we collected these tweets. And then we mapped them on a US map. These, so there were, these were 10,000. So these uh, images of Twitter just represent pockets of tweets. And then what we did was we modeled that, we modeled this, the tweet data against a US map of HIV cases. So this was from a, AIDS view data set which has HIV cases um, around the United States. This is at a county level. And what we found was at a county level, the counties that had people tweeting about things that suggest they're about to engage in HIV risk behaviors were the counties where we found higher number of HIV cases. So this was, this was early research in that we could use something like Twitter or real-time social media as a method for remote monitoring of outbreaks of disease, of HIV cases. There were, there were some challenges. So we, had, we collected the tweets over a six-month period, and then we analyzed the data. We used keyword searches, but there was a lot of manual methods that were used to do this. Um, I mean, I would search through the tweets and try to make inferences about what does it mean when people are talking about something. Does it mean that they're about to um, have sex? Uh, 
So, so in the following, following that study, we put together a team including computer scientists and so data mining people and big data people because the CDC was interested in this, UNAIDS was interested in this. They wanted to see could we ultimately then take these models and create dashboards for them where we could notify the CDC that in rural Indiana there appears to be an outbreak of HIV occurring or outbreaks of other diseases. Could we have dashboards that could notify them of things like this? And the, this, the technology for doing something like this just didn't exist at the time. It doesn't exist. And so we've been working together where can we take the, the manual methods where we had the 550 million tweets that were collected over a time point, and can we improve our algorithms? Can we apply some machine learning algorithms to help improve the algorithms? Can we take that intelligence and be able to apply it in real time so that we can then have we don't have to wait and hold that 550 million tweets, but we can ultimately be able to, in real time, have the 550 million tweets, the 70 million Instagram photos, the 700 million snaps. Can we be able to analyze all that data in real time and run intelligence on it, which can notify UNAIDS, can notify CDC, public health departments, um, whatever it is. Uh, doesn't have to be within health. It can be in political events. and in crime and other areas. So that is what we're working on now. And question? Yes. So, so my understanding of tweets is uh, the geocoded data is like two percent of all tweets. So if you are using geocoded data, which means that you are relying on a biased sample that are subsonected to to record geocodes through their mobile phone, then what, what would be the implication of using that kind of biased data to do this type of prediction? I mean, that's, that's a great question. It's something in the last slide which I, I raised that question for you. Um, I mean, we, one way that we can get at it is that, um, and we're, we're starting to do this now, is we're giving surveys to people. So if we can are the data valid? How biased are they? I mean, I think with every, so by training, I'm a psychologist, I'm an interventionist, and with every study, you're recruiting some type of biased sample. With the earlier study, I mean, it's the same, the same criticism when I talked about these HOPE studies to change HIV risk behavior. We were recruiting people who would, uh, who either were on our social media platform or willing to join it. It's a biased sample. Um, I think it's I think it's a important question and something to be aware of in terms of the limitations of it. And by getting at lots of different technologies and lots of different ways of surveying people, we can help address it. But ultimately, um, just in presenting findings, it's important to be aware of the bias of the sample you're collecting. So it's a good question, good point. So what I wanted to do now was uh, spend a few minutes talking about what are some other application areas that we've started looking into so that you can see how this approach could be applied to other areas. And I'm not sure what, what everyone's background here. Can I get a show of hands? Is everyone, is anyone not an informatics person here? couple of people. Uh, so the people who are in informatics, are you public health people? Or are you, maybe you can just, there are three of you, so if you can. Computer science. Computer science, okay. Public Computer. health, social ecology, environmental psychology. Great, okay. Computer science. Computer science, okay. Um, so, so what I wanted to, to get at is that there's, and the computer science people especially will appreciate this, that the technology and the methods that we're creating can be applied to a lot of different areas. We're not, uh, even though the work that we've done is primarily within the health domain, I want to go over some slides of 
how it can be applied to other areas. So for example, anti-vaccination. Where, where I am, and this is, I see people shaking their heads, yes, understanding this. And where I am, so I'm at UCLA and West Los Angeles is for Los Angeles, the epicenter of people who are against getting their kids vaccinated. <coughs> And that there's information that on Twitter, on social media, the way people uh, communicate, that information can be mined. There's, there's ways of looking and better understanding perceptions of vaccination to be able to, to understand you know, where should public health researchers, public health departments spend their time and effort in order to educate people, in order to understand attitudes and perceptions. So anti-vaccination is an area where we can, you know, read between the tweets or the, the uh, images. Politics. We can find out a lot about people's political attitudes, about whether people will take political action. Young people report actively using social media sites uh, for, for political movements to engage in political activities. Another area, we talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, I was talking about this with Gloria, so civil unrest. If you guys remember the Arab Spring and sweeping across North Africa and the Middle East, how tweets in Tunisia and in different countries there, you can look at those tweets, they were active in promoting protest and promoting political movements, and you can look at people's perceptions and the changing tide and trends of, of uh, political viewpoints. Cyberbullying and, and violence is, is a big one that we're starting to get into. This is one that's that has a lot of interest from social media companies. Uh, it's, there's a lot of safety issues of having people, especially young people, use social media. So for example, seven out of 10 young people report having been bullied online. They, a lot of people experience this frequently and and alarmingly, about nine out of 10 teens who've witnessed some kind of cruel behavior, they ignore it. They don't tell a parent or, or don't tell someone in their school in order to change it. It's, uh, it's particularly bad on MySpace. Uh, and so these are, this is data by by social networking site. This was uh, 2013. I think the newer sites, if you guys are familiar with things like Yik Yak, and there's in the news recently has been Whisper and Secret, where they want to shut down because of the high rates of bullying. Um, so I think those, if, if we were able to look at recent statistics, you'd probably find anonymous social networks like Yik Yak with really high rates of bullying. And it's a, it's an important public health problem because cyberbullying actually more has a greater association to suicidal thoughts than just traditional bullying offline. There's also a 600 six-fold increase in depression among female college students who've been bullied online. So it's an important problem that we can begin looking at how are people interacting with each other, what are they talking about to predict, ultimately prevent bullying. An example of this within violence are, for example, um, there was the college student who, who killed three other students and shot himself. If you look on the right side, this was back of October of last year, on the right side were the tweets of when this happened. He shot three people and, and six injured. 
And if you look on the, the left side, that's what his tweets were a month earlier. I mean, there's, I'm tired of this shit, I'm so done. And there's evidence in there of if we could be able to monitor this, if we could look at what are they talking about, we could prevent episodes like this occurring on campus, if there were tools to be able to monitor this and predict. Well, before, before ending, um, I just want to talk about the examples that I've given relate to tweets, but we can also we can also use similar approaches with other technologies. So we can look at um, we can look at wearable devices. So how are people using wearable devices, and what does it mean the way they're interacting with their wearable devices? Um, we can look at images. Uh, here's one on on online search. So, so in 2014 there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest in selfies and people were searching for selfies. And you can look at differences between men and women on who was searching for selfies. So who do you think was searching for selfies more frequently, men or women? No. Women. Uh, it was actually men. So men were searching for selfie tips. They were searching for selfie tips. They, they knew selfie was, you know, I should be searching for selfie. I should be taking selfies, but how do I do that? So, so they would look up selfie tips to, to better understand how to keep up with the trend of selfies. Data, by looking through data, you can find, this is a, it's a sort of a lighter topic, but you know, you can not only find information about culture, cultural norms, um, gender differences, you can use this for, for looking at outbreaks of disease, you can look at it for important, for solving important real world problems. can also use image data. Uh, there's, there is uh, someone who, he was in TechCrunch and we contacted him. He created a tool for Tinder. So, so Tinder for you guys um, who don't know is an app that you can use to meet other people. It's a dating app where you swipe and you look at faces. Well, this. This person, so he has a computer science background and he decided he was tired of having to have all these conversations with people who he'd meet through Tinder. And so he created, um, first he created a way of detecting women who he would like based on, on facial recognition. Uh, and then he created a bot which would message these women um, up to three times and I thought okay this is sort of on the border of genius and creepy <laughs> um, but he was he was uh, really interested in you know not just how it can be applied for dating but how can this be applied for important real-world outcomes and so we talked to him about you know can we there's some evidence out there about people's faces and how they're looking, whether, whether you can detect experiences of domestic abuse, of physical and sexual abuse. And so we've been talking about can we use facial recognition uh, technologies to be able to better understand and predict, prevent and treat things like abuse. And finally, there's wearable devices, um, you can look at data, so Samsung has developed technologies that are being used to where they're going to try to predict stroke, and then there are uh, the things like iWatch coming out, which we can use to, uh, we can use wearable devices to predict 
other events and people's health behaviors. So I'll finish with these challenges. So, so one of them was already raised, and that's the selection bias. And, and there's, there's no, I don't have the answer to that other than it was, you know, it's the point that's raised that was a valid point. We are right now collecting data on, on, it's always a subset of people. So the point that was raised was only a small percentage are geolocated. Geo so if we're only looking at geolocated data, how representative is it? I mean, you can extend that further where Twitter, if we're looking at Twitter and Twitter is used by 15, 20% of the US population, again, how representative is that? So it's just important to be aware of the bias in this approach, but we see, and you're all aware of it, that the trends are increasing and more and more people are adopting technologies. Um, I mean, we found in our studies as we brought the HOPE intervention to Peru, there's rapid adoption in Peru of technologies. Uh, there's the question of validity. So the, the work that we've been doing has been focused on, the work that I presented was focused on at a population level. So are people tweeting about things or are people talking about things that suggest they're at risk for HIV or there's potential HIV transmission? Well, just because someone says, I need to have sex tonight or I'm going to use drugs, does that mean they actually do that? You know, we're, we're studying this at a population level, but it's another question of whether people actually follow through on what they say they're going to do. Um, and so we're starting to do some work right now where this is with, with uh, UCLA undergraduates. We're also doing this with, um, with some local clinics where we're following people on social media, giving them surveys, and then seeing is there, are they actually following through when we look at their surveys, if we ask college undergraduates, did they drink alcohol? How much did they sleep? Did they use drugs? Um, can we find evidence in their social media, in their tweets, for that they are actually going to do what they say that they did? Um, then there's their modeling issues. So for those of you who followed this area on using things like um, Google flu trends or, or Twitter, there has been some criticism around whether this approach is, is accurate. Um, and, and I think as long as we keep refining these models, they'll improve and get better and better. It's not as if the science isn't at, it's not at perfection, but as we continue working with um, data mining people, machine learning people, we can improve dramatically. So for example, um, with the HIV methods that I showed you, we've now been able to automate those in, in working with Wei Wang, a professor in computer science who gave a talk here. I'm not sure if it was for this, was it for the computer science group or for the computer science group earlier this year. Uh, so we're working with her and, and her team's been able to take that approach and automate it so with about 90%, 85 to 90% accuracy, we can, ha a machine can be able to identify um, in large scale the tweets that are suggestive of HIV or drug use. So we can continue improving on these methods. And then finally, Whenever I give any version of this talk, one of the first three questions always comes up. It's an ethical question of, you know, what does this mean that we're, whether in interventions, we are, uh, in interventions, we are trying to change people's behavior through technologies, or whether we're analyzing what people's behavior, digital behavior, how ethical is it? Uh, you guys remember the Facebook <laughs> Facebook uh, issues that came? So we've actually gone back and for our work in Peru, for our work in Los Angeles, we've gone back and surveyed 
participants in our studies to find out you know, what were the risks and benefits, um, what were the privacy issues, and, and ultimately the concerns that they had going into the study were they realized. So some of those concerns in our initial studies, people were concerned that we were using Facebook or we were using Twitter and they questioned whether these technology companies were involved. And, um, and especially since we were dealing with sensitive populations like um, people at risk for HIV or men who have sex with men, they were concerned about their data, the privacy and confidentiality issues. Uh, but overall, when we surveyed them, they said it was a positive experience. They said that they would continue participating in these studies in the future. Um, the consent process was really important in going over consent forms with them, educating them on how their data will be used was really important to them. Um, and, and overall, we found that um, there's, there's interest and acceptance in having researchers use this information and do these types of studies as long as it's for the benefit of research participants. So I'll stop there and, and just encourage everyone uh, to ask questions and, and hopefully to get involved in, in some part of this. We'd love to have you participate in it. Thank you. You said it was going to be one of the first three questions anyway, so, <laughs> so, so I'm going to push you a little bit about the ethics. Um, well, that, no, maybe not ethics. I mean, do you know um, what's his name? Bernard Harcourt's book, Against Prediction, mm -hmm. um, which is an argument that the use of actuarial or predictive techniques within policing were actually drawing, um, were actually sort of treating, this, treating the symptom and drawing away from programs that might actually treat underlying conditions. So it's providing quick and easy fixes, if you like, and appears to be cost effective, but it's creating a certain kind of social attitude that is not necessarily for the best. And you know, all of your cases are feel good cases, and the policing ain't necessarily so. But I wonder if similar sorts of issues arise. Sure, sure. And I mean, that's what we found with particip participants were comfortable with us as researchers studying this. They're not comfortable with target collecting data on their purchase behaviors and then sending uh, you know, pregnancy tests information to their daughters, right? Um, so purpose matters, purpose matters. There's, there's no way around that. Um, I think that it's sort of like any other, to, I remember a, a book about technologies and it was the invention of the telephone. It talked about, uh, they said when the telephone was invented, there was this uproar of it was changing culturally our society. Uh, so prior to the telephone, people would talk to each other and say, uh, how are you, lovely madam, or hello, dear sir. And then the telephone came about and people started saying hello. And they said, this is horrible. It's changed the way we talk to each other. Um, it's destroying our society. And I think with each, with each new technology, there's, there's always that question of what effect is it going to have on our society. And, and just like the, the slide of in 2004, there was a lot of questions of whether people would use technologies. Would they share information? <coughs> now we know they'll share all kinds of information. So I think the question is not as much for the the researcher, um, but to go back to consumers and say, if, if there's a way where they can be involved more in the decision-making process, um, I think that's important. But, but the purpose definitely matters to people we found. It's yeah, a good question. Yes? Uh, kind of related to what you asked, uh, you said that people are comfortable uh, with you and your team as researchers collecting data, but then are they comfortable with the intervention or uh, what you do with that data? They are. So we ask them a lot of detailed questions about the interventions. Um, one, I mean, there are lots of different types of concerns that 
when we first started these interventions, it was 2008, 2009, the IRB concern, biggest IRB concern was if you're taking a bunch of people who are at risk for HIV, who don't know each other, putting them in a group together, a closed group, are you just going to create more HIV transmission? Are you going to get a whole bunch of people having sex with each other? Um, are you creating like an online sex club? And we found that actually uh, in both groups, in the control group and the intervention group, they changed their sexual risk behaviors and decreased uh, risk behaviors. So that was one concern. There was also, we had peer leaders who were trained to increase HIV testing. And so one concern was if we bring peer leaders on there and, and we have them interacting with peer leaders over 12 weeks and then we take away those peer leaders, is that unethical? Um, do they now expect to be able to continue interacting with these people who are helping them? Um, we found that they appreciated the experience of working with peer leaders, but they didn't, uh, it didn't negatively affect them when the intervention ended. Peer leaders could still continue talking with them, they just weren't part of the intervention anymore. Uh, and I think part of, part of what, what ended up where we got uh, positive experiences is we left it open so they could continue using the groups and they were highly engaged. So we had, uh, after 12 weeks, there was 94% of people were participating in the intervention. They were interacting with each other. We then looked back um, a year later, about 15 to 18 months after we started, and we still had about 84% of people participating. So they were actively involved. And if you remember the social network slide that I sent, that I put up, the people who were most involved were the ones who changed their risk behaviors and got a lot out of it. So I think that was a big part of their acceptance of the intervention, that they were, this became a community of their own. I check back every once in a while. You know, we don't, we're not doing anything with it in terms of research, but people will post something up there saying, I'm homeless, can someone help me? And other people will respond and and say, here are some resources, or I feel, you know, I've been there before. And I think having that sense of community has, at least in our studies, been helpful for creating a positive image and, and making them feel that this is a positive thing that researchers are doing. One more question. Uh, sure. When you said you want to collect data, and uh, what kind of uh, trends would you like to monitor? So, so I gave some examples there with whether it's anti-vaccination and we've talked uh, when there were issues with Ebola, we talked about Ebola, can we monitor perceptions of Ebola, fears of Ebola, so fears of disease. Um, HIV is one that will that we'll continue working on, but it's a difficult area because of, I mentioned the, the updates about data. Well, HIV data are updated infrequently, whereas something like influenza, the reason why there's been a lot of work in influenza is because you can get weekly reports of influenza. So I think learning, doing some training in areas where there are frequently updated data sets will be important, but ultimately, uh, a real value will be in, on the prediction side of can we then take those tools that we've trained from frequently updated data sets and apply them to data sets that come once every year or multiple years so that we can have insights into trends in whether it's disease outbreaks or crime or other things without waiting a few years to analyze changes. Can this method be used by law enforcement, for instance, following certain court decisions? Is there going to be a riot? What should they do? <laughs> Definitely. So we are, there's some people within crime and law enforcement um, from the UCLA side, and, and they have some colleagues down here, actually, um, who we're hoping to get involved. The, there's a lot of interest in that. I mean, also, the, if you think about video, so, their police are now experimenting with 
wearing, uh, having video surveillance. And you can start looking at video surveillance and making predictions about is someone going to pull out a weapon? Is it a weapon or not? Um, is it what is going to happen as an officer is interacting with people? There's a, there's tremendous need on the law enforcement side and the crime side, and, and these technologies and approaches can be applied. Thank you. Yes. Um, thanks. This is really interesting. I'm curious about, so thinking about especially the, the public health kind of things, but in several of these, it seems like one of the sort of the sort of larger class that I'm hearing of reasons for doing the prediction have to do with efficiency. Targeted intervention of the people who are most likely to need that intervention. Are there other ways that this prediction can maybe more qualitative ways about not just if or yes intervention or not, but about how to tune an intervention or how to think about, I mean, other ways of thinking about intervention in this space? Definitely. So, so one of the things, so again with uh, Professor Wei Wang, who's the, the data mining person, I mean, one question we have, and, and we're looking at it within HIV and drug use, HIV is a good example. So the way people, or drugs is a good example, the way people talk about drugs on the street, it's not static. It changes over time. So if you're, uh, if you're working for a public health department, and you're trying to identify changes in drug use, well, you can ask, you know, typical qualitative ways, maybe you talk to people on the street and you try, or you bring in focus groups, you try to figure out what are the terms, what are the words on the street being used for drugs so we can, when we give surveys to people, when we interview people, when we listen in, we can identify those drug terms. Well, through these methods, we could be able to predict how slang is changing, how people are changing the way they're talking over time and be able to refine those models without having to go out and do um, extensive research in the community. You know, we can, it brings the community in and has the community become a part of the research because they're providing uh, open access to their data. Does that answer your question? Yeah, good question. And I mean, we, it's, it's an area where, where, I mean, we'd love to have people involved in it because it's an important question, and most of us are more quantitative people. We don't have the, those, the qualitative background or expertise to, to help answer or address those questions. Yes? I have, I have a question about the information retrieval performance of, uh, of your uh, uh, search strategy. So, so you said that uh, uh, keywords and that it's the primary uh, approach to kind of uh, narrow down, uh, and then uh, so that will give you pretty good uh, precision, but may not may not be a very good recall uh, from the information retrieval point of view. So, I wonder, like for for sexual behavior, for instance, the can be this language can be very subtle. Uh, people may not say I want to have sex. They do really want to use very subtle language to kind of mask that kind of uh, intention or behavior. So I wondered uh, what, 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 what are your uh, methods to kind of address those challenges which people use alternative language to say the things that you actually want to capture? So, if, so in the examples I gave, I mean, people are explicitly, in a lot of cases, people are very explicit and that's what surprised us. They will say, uh, you know, I'm going to go. Well, but but then you don't know what you mean, right? Because you are using those keywords that what you capture. But what about other kind of uh, uh, subtle ways of expression, which is not part of your keyword search? So if I so what we initially did was heavy on the manual methods. Um, when I presented the the first prediction type study was we were going through and hand coding and seeing does this appear to be indicative of HIV risk behavior or not. So a lot of manual methods. Um, from there, and so we had started with a keyword list and phrases, and we would go through and see, you know, what is the hit rate? Um, 
to be able to identify are these HIV related or not. At the same time, I think the point you're raising is the key words don't, I mean, there may be false negatives in there, is that, uh, and so that's where working with the data mining people, they are working on the methods. I mean, these are, they are uh, creating methods for being able to, to detect that by looking at the patterns. So, um, so for the specific models, you know, I'll, I'll let Wei address what are the specific models, how is her team going about doing that. But through looking at you know, different co-occurrence of words we're, and through using machine learning, we're able to find additional tweets um, where there are words or phrases which didn't exist that we weren't, didn't find in the initial keyword list. So this is a follow-up to Kai's question about the biased uh, sample. So um, it is a biased sample, and it's a very small percentage of the population. But yet you are able to find that the small sample is predictive of certain trends. And so I'm wondering, is there are there certain characteristics about the sample that makes these individuals have their finger on the pulse of what's going on in the society? So have you, have you looked at characteristics of the, the tweeters, and what can you say about that? That's a great question. I'm wondering, were you asking and you already have a possible answer? Because I've... Yes, <laughs> but I want to hear... I want to hear one. So, so Practically, I don't know if this is, is what you're looking for, but in practical terms, the reason why I presented the data on increasing use of social media among minority populations, among gay populations, is because of their risk for HIV. So, so even though they're, we're looking at a biased sample, there's a large number of social media users who are from populations who are at the highest risk for HIV. And so there is that uh, co-occurrence where, where the people who we're finding are likely to be um, from minority populations. And, and so if we're finding uh, keywords that they're using that are related to HIV risk, and we're also finding uh, HIV cases in those areas, I think that's one possible explanation. Did you, what were your Well, thoughts I, I was also thinking that these, uh, these users are probably more tech savvy mm -hmm. than the general population. Um, I mean, we know from other studies that social media users tend to be more educated, a little bit wealthier, and so they might have access to certain information that other groups don't have. So I'm thinking of characteristics that might be orthogonal to the things that you're studying? We've found, I and mean, I didn't go through the HIV epidemiology, but we've done a lot of research on social media users and people who are using social media or who are online um, to find sex partners or people who are using social media are potentially at higher risk for HIV. Uh, and so there is that connection already, and we know a lot about social media users and their drug and HIV risk behaviors that would help us understand this specific case of HIV. Um, and then what you're saying is, is a great point about, I mean, there is, it, the demographic information is changing, um, but there's a lot that we can, by understanding the demographics of people who are using these technologies, can help us better understand um, the trends that we're seeing. So I, I would like to invite everyone to come one floor below. We have a social hour. We have refreshments. And I would like to thank the speaker again. Thank you.